Okay, well, um, this actually fits in perfectly with what I'm going to uh, talk about with you today, so I'd like you to reflect on what you've just felt in the last few minutes. It's been <laughs> actually, uh, uh, I did violate my own uh, uh, intent here, which was not to start with a joke, but an apology. Uh, and uh, to tell you that uh, a lot of the words on my slides have migrated to these pages here, and so I'm going to be presenting in a different dynamic than is typical for this conference, for sure. Um, it's, it's actually more of a conceptual foray into uh, questions of mobility in light of the virtual and the physical. And I have to admit, actually, that the whole talk is mostly inspired by the very cool conference title that we have, uh, Intercultural Competence Mobility, Virtual and Physical, and it got me thinking, what does that even mean? What are mobility, virtual and physical? The first sentence from the uh, call for papers. I found that observations have been made for a long time about the movement of people and products and symbols across the real physical and geographic spaces on one hand, and the movement of digital texts and multimedia representations, embodied avatars among virtual domains on the other hand. We can think of people like Arjun Apadurai or Manuel Castells, right, who have uh, po popularized notions of social and economic and cultural technological change through these interweaving global flows, they call them. And often, in my view, though, there's an awkward re re reduction in the way that we talk about what moves and how. People move around the world in physical spaces, and we move around online worlds in virtual spaces. And somehow, as this title reflects in the first call for papers, they move between them. But how? We don't often talk about how one becomes the other, how the virtual becomes the physical, and vice versa, how people, materials, and symbols virtualize and physicalize or actualize, and with what consequences. I think studying interface processes of virtualizing and actualizing as verbs and not as nouns seems really important for language learners and teachers, since many of the tools we use for intercultural communication, like mobile, desktop, or classroom-to-classroom -classroom video conferencing, promise, but they don't deliver transparency. Something is always lost, something is always gained, but also, and more important for this paper, things are always changed in the process. So in this paper, I'm drawing from first-hand observations, uh, video recordings, participant interviews about students' experiences in synchronous video-mediated language courses where I've been working at Yale in order to think together with you about movement and mobility across digital and physical domains. I'm arguing that virtualization and actualizations, these are terms from Pierre Levy in a 1999 book, of learner subjectivities and textual practices across these audiovisual interfaces are two reciprocal and constant areas of movement that shed valuable light upon opportunities for and also barriers to intercultural learning in distance classroom settings and other distance learning settings as well. So I'll start with a, a quick definition of a virtual, uh, virtualization and actualization, how I'm understanding these words as a kind of mobility or mobilities. And I'll apply these uh, ideas to three areas uh, of interest for me as I've sat together with students and teachers in video con conferencing classrooms over the past four to five years at Yale, uh, Columbia, and Cornell universities. And I'm, I'd like to think together with you about how the nature of language students and teachers' experiences in classrooms like this may be changing when some classrooms don't have physical teachers and uh, classmates are often dozens or hundreds of miles away. So these are three relatively kind of common elements of interest to people researching language and teaching online. I didn't know it was going to do the fade in here, so uh, this is kind of acting on its own as well, which is also to my point. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm thinking about these, these sort of broad uh, conceptual areas, and I'm not wedded to these, uh, this terminology here, but just to get you thinking in certain ways. Uh, interfaces to interfacing, multimodality to remodalization, embodied learning to relearning embodiment. Uh, earlier, I pointed out that the two kinds of mobility in the conference title, virtual and physical, you know, people like uh, John Uri uh, in 2007 and a lot of other writings have argued for a mobilities paradigm for the social sciences and said that we can think of at least five different kinds of mobility uh, uh, involved in social processes that include things like language, teaching and learning and intercultural communication. So we have uh, corporeal or bodily travel where people, uh, real people, actually move at different uh, distances and frequencies, durations of time through modalities of movement. We, we're all here in Tucson, but many of us weren't yesterday. 
physical movement of objects of various kinds and a varying scale, imaginative travel, things that happen when you go onto a website or you read a novel and you imagine yourself or others moving, virtual and online travel uh, where we go places on different websites, communicative travel through various mediums of interpers interpersonal communication. So Uri's argument is not that these should be uh, uh, identified or analyzed, studied on their own or separately, but a mo mobility's paradigm sees them interacting together. It emphasizes the complex assemblage between these different mobilities that may make and contingently maintain social connections across varied and multiple distances. And the paradigmatic example, or one of them, he gives so many, uh, is the beach. You think about the beach as a kind of uh, interface between uh, different types of material and, and people and processes. Uh, it brings together vacationers and residents, cars and boats, birds and fish, po postcards and movies, Facebook check-ins and Instagram selfies, and transforms them all in the process. People don't just take Instagram pictures here and post them. The Instagram pictures produce people and produce travelers and careers and reputations as well. These are very uh, complex uh, assemblage of processes that are uh, in happening together. So virtualization and actualization are terms that uh, the philosopher uh, and media theorist Pierre Levy in his book uh, Becoming Virtual Reality in the Digital Age talks about. They're motivated by the relatively new spread of the internet, especially at his time in, uh, in 1999, but they're meant to provide insight into general dynamics of change and emergence and growth in natural life and in human society. So Levy writes that virtualization, and you'll have to bear with me, this is the biggest piece of text in the whole talk, consists in the transition from the actual to the virtual, an exponenti uh, exponentiation of the entity under consideration. Virtualization is not a derealization, but a change of identity, a displacement of the center of ontological gravity of the object considered. Rather than being defined principally through its actuality, the entity now finds its essential consistency within a problematic field, a delocalized, desynchronized, and collectivized functioning. So Levy is far from alone in asserting that virtuality and reality are not opposed, right? Reality is, a virtual reality is also reality. Strictly speaking, he says, the virtual should not be compared with the real, but with the actual, because these are two different ways of being. Bodies become virtualized when their sensory systems are amplified and extended with new tools, when their representations are doubled on video screens, when they test the boundaries of what it's possible to do. Memory is virtualized through writing, which desynchronizes and delocalizes knowledge, creating distance between knowledge and its subject, he says. Well, reading, even the reading that I'm engaged in with you right now and here, is a kind of actualization as the reader and you reading this text resolve the problem of many different potential meanings uh, of virtual problematic in an inventive and always singular manner. And I bet you all have a different take from that, that reading up there as well. Um, so together, I think virtualization and actualization describe movements between entities that are on the one hand a limited, specific material here and now in the flesh, and on the other, deterritorialized, exponentiated, contingent, networked. And they might just be happening every day and all the time in classrooms like mine and yours. And so I've intended this class, oh, these things are never going to disappear, are they? <laughs> yeah, here they go. You can just watch them. Uh, oh, those transitions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Humor is, is a virtualization or an actualization? Well, I love to think about that. But, uh, so there's been a lot of virtualization in the talk already, but I'd like to talk about some real classes for a moment and actual classes. Um, places where I've been, uh, and this is a picture from a multi-year initiative, uh, uh, a classroom, a class in a multi-year initiative that involves three schools I've mentioned already where I work, Yale, uh, Columbia University, and Cornell University, that use high-definition video conferencing to share small for-credit classes uh, in the less commonly taught languages, and thereby fill and expand the offerings at each school. Um, you can see a lot of the people who are involved in there. Uh, uh, Chris Kaiser is a new program manager who wasn't in this picture, which was taken about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, this project was launched in the 2011 to 2012 academic year. Uh, it was funded largely through a Mellon Foundation grant, a five-year grant that helped build the infrastructure, but the people are what make it move in a many different ways. You can uh, take a look at more. Uh, if you're interested in reading about the project, I won't talk about how it actually works, the memorandum, memorandum of understanding and so on between the schools, but you can look at sharedcourseinitiative.com if you're interested in that. Um, 
So here we are, we are back in a Tamil class that's being taught in Columbia and shared with students in uh, Cornell. And an instructor, an instructor in the room, in the sending classroom, has students in her or his immediate presence. As you can see, the students in the orange chairs are it, uh, in a Columbia classroom, as well as in one or two receiving classrooms. So investigating possibly critical differences in how they learn and teach what their experience is like uh, in things that don't show up in, in measurements like oral proficiency interviews or other types of, of uh, quantitative or even qualitative measures in the classroom um, is one of the goals of my research and other researchers who are working on this. And we are working on it in different schools ask, uh, asking different kinds of questions. What I'm presenting to you today represents largely my interests and not necessarily the interests of the entire project. Um, although they, they interweave so much. Um, so the episodes that I want to share with you uh, from here on out have uh, to do with uh, this, oh, let's just start here, a small Polish class that was taught in the fall of 2015, a very small class of just three heritage Polish language learners. Uh, Pamela and Andrew are there uh, on the left side uh, in Yale in their classroom with uh, Katya, their instructor on the right, and Cindy, uh, who appears on the screen behind them right now uh, at uh, Columbia University. That screen actually is mirrored. There's two screens in the room. They're looking at the same image that we're seeing there, too, on the opposite side wall. Um, this is more what my view in the class typically looked like, where I sat and, and uh, observed the class and helped with technical problems for a semester um, and took a lot of the notes that uh, I'm presenting to you here today, where it was about 20 hours or so of classroom observations, uh, a couple of hours of video recordings of the class, and also uh, interviews with the participants uh, during and after their class to learn about their experiences a little bit more. So the fall 2015 semester was Katya's first time teaching in a classroom like that, and the student's first time being in a, uh, a classroom like this. Uh, and then neither, none of them had taken an online class, they hadn't taken a MOOC, they hadn't been uh, using uh, Skype or any other tools for learning. So this was a new experience, and one of the first things they had to do was to get to know the classrooms a little bit better. And you can see these are three pictures of, of rooms in Columbia, Cornell, and Yale. We have multiple rooms. They're all laid out differently. They have different numbers of screens. They're different sizes. Uh, the technology actually works differently. The video uh, conferencing systems are, are a little different, although they inter they're interoperative. They talk to each other. Learning these interfaces is one of the first things that learners and students need to do, of course. And uh, it doesn't just, it's not a matter of just learning it. It has tangible, right? Tang uh, effects in the entire uh, carrying out of the class and the, and the people in it as well. So, but you can see a kind of common pattern in some of these pictures, which is a semicircular pattern that uh, the administrators, myself included, have encouraged and worked with faculty to teach within. So you see the, uh, again, Tamil instructor standing sort of in between the two sides, uh, uh, between and visible to the students uh, with him at Columbia and uh, on the screen at Cornell. Um, and so the Polish classroom, however, uh, had its three students, and Katya decided that she wasn't going to stand in between the two sides. Uh, it was small enough for her to sit side by side with the other two students uh, facing the Columbia student, Cindy. Um, so at, a start, at the start of a class uh, on a, one day in November, for instance, here we are in the classroom. I observed Cindy sitting down in front of her table at Columbia, and I zoom it in. Uh, we can see her sitting down over there with her books, her laptop, a copy of a reading, remote control for the video conferencing system, mouse and a keyboard for the room computer, and a whiteboard marker all spread out uh, before her. You can see to her left, our right, is a, uh, a traditional sort of pen uh, dry erase whiteboard that she used as well. On the Yale side, uh, Katya, I wrote in my field notes, sits down closer to the students than I'd ever seen her sit in the past. Pamela first offers, then brings the iPad over and adjusts the camera so that Cindy can see what's going on in the room better. Katya pulls her seat in even closer towards Andrew and Pamela so that she can be seen on the screen. She checks back with me sitting in the back of the room to see that I'm still visible or that I can see, this, see the room, her awareness of the researcher or participant in the room, and I say, I'm fine. Orienting oneself to the screen, to the constant demand to be mutually visible to the camera or conversely, allowing communication to take place without the visual presence of one's interlocutor. As Cindy said, she ha often had to do when the Yale participants became invisible to her, were constant aspects of classroom practice. The imperative to face the screen is perhaps mundane to most of us in this room because we all use Zipe, uh, Skype and uh, Zipe. 
the new blend between <laughs> Skype and Zoom, um, FaceTime, <laughs> other face-to-face -face video chat technologies. Hi, everybody, uh, 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 live stream folks. Uh, so it's <laughs> in the shared language classroom, though, it's, it was a dramatic reminder to me that uh, far from eliminating this privileged power center in the front of the room, the podium, uh, so to speak, where the lecturer has lectured in the past uh, in the manner of the rhetoric of the uh, 21st century design cla uh, smart classroom, the power center of these smart classrooms, the modern uh, classrooms with a video screen, has merely changed its occupant in a lot of cases from teacher to screen. The shift also interfaced new forms of collaborative activity where paradigmatically teacherly classroom management activities and responsibilities were distributed and shared among students as well. So on a day in late October, uh, we see Cindy writing on the, the board here, uh, in the middle of an impromptu discussion about refugees in Poland and campus protests underway at Yale and at Columbia, and this is the fall of 2015, Katya uh, stood up as if to write on the whiteboard, right up from the seat where she's seated, uh, seated right there. Um, but she saw the screensaver was still on on the class computer, the screen on the right there. Uh, and instead of logging in, she asked Cindy instead uh, at Columbia to write the word uh, in the Columbia classroom. Uh, Cindy stood up and she wrote in red ink on the whiteboard to her left tentatively as Katya offered her letters, uh, spelling it out, an affirmation, Uchodzice. Uh, refugees. And Katya clapped, affirming that she'd spelled it right. Yes, yes, she said, Uchodzice. Katya turned around and said it out loud, asking me as well, can you read it? And the conversation continues for a few minutes, and obviously I can't read it well. This is another sub-story and the, uh, the, um, the observations uh, as well. But the conversation continued, and, and Cindy continued writing on the, the whiteboard. And so, Along with its many other meanings, uh, I think, uh, thinking about this example, I, I think about Rick Kern's uh, book as well, uh, uh, Language, Literacy, and Technology, has, that can be read, I think, as an extended exposition of the importance of this interface, uh, why the medium matters in the social design of meaning through technologically enabled languaging practices. In his words, in Rick Kern's words, modes, technologies, and languages are not neutral conduits. And in light of our notion of virtualization and actualization as kinds of mobility, we might also question if and how modes, technologies, and language don't just serve as biased conduits, but also fundamentally recreate students and teachers. Brandon Hookway has a really neat two, a book out called Interface in 2014 from MIT Press, I think, and uh, says this about interfaces. To questions of interaction, the interface bring, uh, brings questions of agents and agency as a threshold condi uh, condition that extends into and incorporates the environment that it bounds. The interface demands of the entities or states or teachers or students that enter into relation with it a surrendering, a surrendering of claims of self-sovereignty and of identity is distinct from the threshold as it's the threshold that becomes the standard by which these are defined and the source from which their agency is derived. So I want to acknowledge Cindy's agency as she hopped up from her seat and she wrote Uchotze on the board. That was agential for sure. Pamela and Andrews, as they helped Katya navigate between the touchscreen whiteboard and the web browsers on the right-hand room display, Katya, the teacher's own agency, as she enthusiastically learned to use these tools, and she did, and she continues to. But at the same time, differences in the human and material affordances of each classroom also seem to predispose students on each side to expression in certain modes with certain tools and to engage in transductions of meaning across written, spoken, gestural, and other modes at a moment's notice. So here, for instance, we see writing is happening, or it already happened, on three different kinds of surfaces in three different mediums, notebooks, a dry erase whiteboard in the Columbia classroom, and the electronic whiteboard in the Yale classroom. On a day early in the semester when Pamela was absent, uh, Katya had asked Andrew and Cindy to write key vocabulary items that identified from a reading onto their respective whiteboards. Andrew, in this room, in the Yale room, held his cell phone in his hand as he wrote on the electronic whiteboard that you see on the right side of this room. On the other side, Cindy held a piece of paper to write hers on a dry erase whiteboard, but neither could see what the other had written. Andrew and Katya had to figure out how to send the whiteboard content to Cindy's screen, while Cindy had to read aloud all she had written because the angle of the camera made it illegible. 
Questions of visibility and audibility per permeated and transformed practices of all sorts in these classrooms, as they arguably do all kinds of synchronous audiovisual encounters online. Because of the difficulty of doing peer review of writing assignments that students would have printed and brought to the classroom in a prototypical brick and mortar uh, kind of classroom, Katya and the students decided together that they would instead share their homework on the electronic whiteboard, making their individual texts public for reading, annotation, discussion, and critique. A kind of illustration of what Pierre Lévy uh, uh, has called the Mobius effect of virtualization, how it turns private into the public, how it turns inside out, shared, uh, uh, personal into the shared, um, with uh, lots of consequences. And just like writing, gesture and expression, embodied expression, which we think of as, as so part and parcel to ourselves and our own individual identities, also seem to be brought about through the interface and by the interface. Andrew turned around to me at one point uh, in a conversation when he and Pamela Cindy had been particularly animated in the reciprocal gaze and their movements, and he said to me in English, we're talking about flirting. But <laughs> this seemed like uh, maybe it was just animated because of the topic, uh, but one doesn't know. Other times it would have been inferred from voice, and uh, the gesture had to be inferred from, from uh, voice and even from memory. Uh, Cindy told me in her interview. So on one, uh, one day, the students were reading a selection from the epic uh, poem in Polish, Pan Tadeusz by Adam Mickiewicz, and Katya stood up to reenact the picking of the mushrooms in the scene as the young protagonist must have done, she said, in the story. She swooped down to the floor in front of her two Yale students picking mushrooms, uh, but disappeared partially from view from Cindy with only her arm and then her upper body and then only her arm again visible to Cindy. Cindy said, I imagined what she was doing. So, to my eye, episodes like these, and we're, we're moving on and getting close here to our uh, launch uh, to the next session, I think. <laughs> But episodes like this uh, bespeak the importance of considering not just multimodality and embodied learning as key facets of communication and learning in distance classrooms like this one, but what I've bookmarked uh, with the very awkward uh, and temporary names of probably remodalization and relearning embodiment. Please don't remember them. They're not, they're not supposed to uh, last longer than this talk, really. But with respect to the first, I'm really thinking along the lines of Rick, Ricky Edema's resemutization, which kind of complements the notion of multimodality by following these historical trajectories over time of discourse as they translate across modes to more and more stable and authoritative and untouchable forms, and in some ways, Sebastian's fabulous process of game making, right? The incredible complex spoken and, and written and drawn and enacted uh, uh, conversations that materialize into a game that looks stable to us, maybe if we were to see it without the benefit of having heard his talk, for instance, is an example of that kind of uh, resemitization. Um, but the virtuous, virtualization of, of texts and people in the language classroom, I think, need not encase ideologies or, or uh, other sort of preset ways of thinking. Uh, paying attention to, to remodalization or re resemitization in video, mediated, uh, video mediated interaction could also mean paying attention to the particular ways in which unpredictable effects are originated when a set of different semiotic resources are conflated in a single meaning-making meaning -making event. Um, and Sindoni's book uh, is really fabulous, I think, in thinking about how modes interact and meanings are made in, in uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, multimodal uh, interaction. So Katya's practical decision that she made in her class to sit next to her students, Andrew and Pamela, in the Yale classroom and not between them when we're standing up on the screen. It could be seen just as a virtual, a sort of a, uh, an interpersonal realignment and a, an acknowledgement of the chain, um, both, uh, both an interpersonal uh, relationship, uh, relationship change and also an acknowledgement of the way that the matrix of power in some sense has changed in the classroom where people and cameras and screens are all agents of some sort. When Cindy read the words out loud on her white, uh, whiteboard, those words that would have been plainly visible to other students if they were in the same room, that's 
also a sort of speech actualization, giving rise to the vulnerability of possibly incorrect pronunciation in front of her teacher and her peers, but also the power to hold the floor while she read out what she had written and hold the attention of her peers uh, with something that she alone could see. Katya's applause at Cindy's correct spelling of uhojitsu on screen suggested to me sort of a, a transformation of speech into writing through distance technology and into affect. She was visibly happy, she smiled, she turned around, she wanted to share the moment with her students. In her interview with me, after the Polish class had ended, Katya returned time and time again to the idea of the classroom as a performance space. Uh, and she wrote, uh, she, she's, this is a quote from the interview here as well. This is a stage effect that she kept pointing out. It was enhanced by the technology. She said, because of these cameras, that changes something in the student's awareness of acting. And if the student's uh, gestures were more exaggerated in, uh, in a play that they performed synchronously on the last day of class, then it was also partly because they had been learning for months to make themselves more visible to the screen. This was helped, Andrew right here during this play told me, by habitually monitoring his own presence, his own likeness in the inset self-view window on the screen, as many of us probably do, checking our hair on Skype uh, when we're talking. So this is what I'm trying to suggest uh, by moving embodied learning for the moment and, and moving to the admittedly awkward embodiment learning, the notion that audiovisual mediation in a shared language classroom is just one way that technology exponentiates or virtualizes the self, as Pierre Levy might say. Language learners as multilingual subjects uh, definitely have more room, uh, as Claire Kromsch has said, greater maneuver for creativity and play on the one hand in these virtualized spaces, but also an anxiety of living in and through the network. So in this view, students like Cindy, Pamela, and Andrew, and teachers like Katya are, of course, focused on learning Polish. That's what's going on in this classroom. But uh, what I hope I've brought a little bit uh, to you here today is also the sense that um, as, as Mary Buchholz and, and Kira Hall have talked about recently, that bodies uh, produce language, of course, but language also produces bodies. Rodney Jones asks us in a recent uh, book chapter, uh, uh, ha uh, how does our approach to discourse change when we start to see readers and writers as artifacts constructed by texts and the invisible algorithms that govern them? We who teach, research, and learn with students and student bodies through interfaces of varying kinds might do well to look into just how audiovisually mediated and network language learning extends these network bodies and with what consequences and what opportunities. These questions are leading me in directions of post-humanist applied linguistics like Alistair Pennycook has been talking about recently, online ethnography and its, uh, its, its many uh, opportunities, new media art and performance, phenomenologies of affect and other directions. But for the moment right now and here and, and given the, uh, the, the time, I'm just thankful that you've entertained my reading or hopefully actualizing these prepared words for you even though the rest of me has gone through somewhat of a virtualization in the process. So thanks.